So this year, the Friends of the Wendon Road Cemetery have done an awful lot of work in all parts of the old burial ground, with more work to happen over the autumn. You can follow our progress by looking at the diary page on our website or following us on Facebook for a wider idea of what we're doing. But today I want to focus on just one feature of this year's work to improve a prominent area in the middle of the cemetery. One of the major projects in 2021 was continuing to improve a junction of pathways in the middle of the cemetery. Back in 2019, we had prepared three memorials to the Dunsford family, which straddled two sides of a path, and this year we worked on the opposite side. This was a continuation of the work we've been doing over the whole ten years of our existence, first improving the view of the cemetery along the main path from the Wendon Road, then around the area near the Anglican Chapel Mound, and now moving into the interior of the cemetery to start joining up other clusters of work we've done, especially that in the western boundary. So in November and December 2019, the Friends arranged for the repair of three memorials associated with the family of John Thomas Upjohn Dunsford, once manager of the Bridgewater Mercury newspaper. The three memorials are clustered around a junction of two paths in the Anglican portion of the cemetery. It was decided to have these repaired, partly because they have an important story for the history of the town, but also as they would have a big impact on the conservation of this part of the cemetery. The work was carried out by fine memorials of Bridgewater and paid for entirely by the Friends. On 25th July 1883, a fire broke out in the Bridgewater Mercury offices at the corner of 4th Street and Court Street. At the house lived John Dunsford, his wife Ellen Dunsford and four of their six children. Rosina Maud, 11 years, Edith Mabel, 9 years, Florence Ethel, 6 years, Beatrice Ellen, 3 years, as well as Elizabeth Barber, 16 years, their maid. That morning, Ellen was awoken in panic by the smell of smoke coming from downstairs and hurried to wake John. He rushed out of their room to a wall of suffocating smoke and made his way to the two younger daughters' bedroom. He called for both and they rushed to him, but on the landings, Florence fell from his arms and was lost in the smoke. Back in the bedroom, John managed to drop little Edith out of the second-story window to be caught by a man in Court Street who, among others, had rushed to help. John then threw a bed into the street and lowered his choking wife down the window ledge. He had hoped she would drop onto the bed, but she missed and sustained a deadly head injury. Overwhelmed with the smoke himself, he lowered himself out the window, hanging for dear life from the window ledge. Holding on for a long time, eventually two post office clerks, one called Alfred Friend and the other just Cole, managed to find a ladder. It was too short, but Friend stood at the very top and had John stand on his shoulders. Meanwhile, in the upper story of the house, the maid of Elizabeth Barber, likewise engulfed in smoke, tried to get the two smaller children to join her to safety. They would, however, not move, saying, no, no, Pa will fetch us. And eventually, she was forced to flee. Fortunately, she could get along the roof and was rescued by folk on the adjoining building. However, tragically, the body of toddler Beatrice was found by the window, while the eldest, Rosina Maud, was found under the bed. John and Edith Mabel survived, and Ellen died from her injuries a few days later. The two brave postal workers who had saved John were later awarded marble clocks for their bravery. So these are the three memorials we had repaired. Memorial G1 contains the victims of the dreadful fire of 25th July 1883. Next, we have Memorial F11. This stands on the other side of the path, buried here are John and his two elder children. The two eldest children were away from home at a special school for the blind at the time of the fire, and so were saved. Next, we have Memorial G16. This plot contains the burial of John's second wife, Emma. It sits behind the memorial to the victims of the fire. So that improved one side of the path, and this year we decided to turn to the other. As well as generally tidying up that area, we focused on three large crosses, Dement, Hickman and Balting. Each of these three memorials were meticulously researched by Gillian Treviway, Hilary Southall and Claire Spicer, who have done so much to recover the stories of so many folk buried in the cemetery. So furthest from the pathway junction is the Dement Memorial, which is to the memory of William and Jane Dement. William Dement, 1836 to 1907, was the son of a carpenter and landlord of the White Horse Inn in Penelope Lou, who had died of cholera in 1849. Appropriately for Somerset, for many years William was clerk and cheese factor with the firm of Messrs Thompson and Collins, wholesale cheese factors of St Mary Street. 
This was a time of new scientific and technological thinking being applied to food production, which included cheese making and led to the popularization and standardization of cheddar cheese as we know it today. Bridgewater cheddar cheese was especially fries for its flavor. The other cheese made in the area was kefili, which was more perishable, whereas cheddar could be kept for much longer without refrigeration. The traditional cheddar cheese was colored on the outside with reddle, or redding, a red powder quarried on the mendips. William was apparently well known in agricultural circles, and he was frequently judge at the Bath and West Somerset County agricultural shows, and was a recognized authority on all matters related to cheese. In the meantime, William had a slightly choppy political life, being on the executive committee for reforming a liberal working men's association, and he was caught up in the scandal surrounding bribery at election time in the 1869 government commission. Essentially, each time there was an election, agents from the Liberal and Conservative parties would arrive in town with a pot of gold, which they would give to local agents to persuade the town's 600 or so voters to vote one way or the other. Although there was a core of principled and uncorruptible voters, quite a few of the more apathetic townsmen came to expect bribes in return for their votes. This was common practice in almost all towns in Britain at the time, but Bridgewater was made an example of, and subsequently disenfranchised. William was accused of being one of the bribing agents, although not an especially committed one. After the scandal, we don't hear anything more controversial about William, so after having been burnt by this affair, he kept well out of it from there on in. In 1856, William had married Jane Gwyther, a bonnet maker, the daughter of a master mariner from Tenby, who had settled in Bridgewater. Jane was born in 1820, and was some 16 years older than William. By 1841, age 21, she had been working as a bonnet maker, probably from home, buying in the straw braid, stitching and then selling the complete bonnets, either to a milliner to decorate, or selling them herself at market. Alternatively, she might have been selling them to a middleman, such as a wholesaler in Bristol, such as James Hill, who regularly advertised in Bridgewater, selling straw plats, and who probably had a representative to Bridgewater to buy the completed bonnets as well, that he could then sell on. There were more than a dozen other specialist straw bonnet makers in Bridgewater during the 1840s, so Jane was part of a small industry in the town. The couple would ultimately come to live at Tenby Villa on Taunton Road, named after Jane's father's hometown. The Dement Memorial repair was a relatively easy job for fine memorials. They laid a new foundation for the plinth, then pinned the cross back into place. The Friends volunteers then tidied up the curbs and added chippings. The next memorial along remembers the family of Hickman. William Hickman's family did not come from Bridgewater or even Somerset. He was born in 1842 in Newbury, Berkshire, the son of a prosperous chemist. William followed in his father's footsteps and by 1861 was working as an apprentice in a large chemist shop in Maidstone in Kent. A chemist's shop in the 19th century usually had a long wooden counter which was highly polished and behind that, a row of shelves displaying glass bottles and jars containing all the ingredients needed for medicines. On 9th of February 1870, William married Elizabeth Aidy in St Mary's Church, Paddington. Eliza also came from Newbury, so William probably knew her from childhood. William and Eliza were already expecting their first child, and they moved to Bridgewater soon after the wedding. Neither William nor Eliza seem to have any family connection to Bridgewater, so it is possible that William simply answered an advertisement to purchase an existing chemist shop and business there. By 1871, William and Eliza were living over their own chemist shop in Eastover. This stood next to the old White Hart, although the building no longer stands. The Bridgewater Mercury in the 1870s carried frequent advertisements showing Williams working hard to attract customers, and these advertisements give an idea of the large range of goods he was selling, such as his own remedies and patent medicines, as well as practical health aids such as chest protectors and toothbrushes. Many people could not afford to go to a doctor, so a chemist provided a vital service by selling cheap ready-made medicines. William also sold candles and was an agent for lamp oils. He also gained additional income by working as an emigration agent, helping people in the local area find new lives abroad. Some of his adverts listed many of his goods, items such as remedies for indigestion, skin and hair care products, at least four different types of hair restorers for baldness, toothpastes, hair and toothbrushes, as well as a wide selection of cordials, juices, lemonade and mineral water. As well as products for human use, William sold horse and cattle medicines of every description. The products advertised were the -the over-the-counter remedies, but William would have also stocked products such as laudanum, which was highly addictive, leeches, 
as well as other restrictive products such as arsenic, widely used as rat poison. Customers would have had to sign William's poisons register to buy this, and William would only have sold to customers he would have known. William's own remedies advertised, the rhubarb, ginger and dandelion pills for indigestion and liver complaints, and the balsam of honey for coughs and colds, both sound like pleasant herbal remedies. As a chemist and druggist, William was trained to make up and dispense all sorts of medicines, both those prescribed by a doctor and those which his own experience had taught him might be helpful. In 1878, William also registered as a dentist. William and Eliza were engaged in the religious, social and charitable life of the town. William served on the town council and they were reported in the Mercury as taking part in a soiree giving an aid of St John's Church Improvement Fund in 1876. William also was active on St John's Church Burial Board, which managed the brand new Bristol Road Cemetery. In 1881, William and Eliza moved from above the shop to Church Street across the road, and William also brought a pair of semi-detached houses called Quantock Villas by the Fairfield, which he rented out to tenants. However, William had also been investing in stocks and shares, badly, which brought him to the point of bankruptcy soon after, and he had to be bailed out by his father. More troubles would come in the 1880s when he fell into dispute with his tenant, Mrs. Lovibond, a widow living in one Quantock Villas. In 1888, William set about improving this house around the confused elderly lady, and builders demolished part of her front wall, excavated a room under the house, and put a window into the new room, all while Mrs. Lovibond was still there and complaining. This caused considerable mess and some damp, and she took him to court after moving out. By 1891, William and Eliza had moved out of Two Church Street and were living back over the chemists, a result of their hard times. But by 1901, they had moved over to their property at Two Quantock Villas on Durley Road. Eliza died on 4th July 1919. William died at the end of September 1923. Repair of the Hickman Memorial was another relatively straightforward job, and another solid foundation, and the pretty Gothic cross was pinned back into place. The third memorial repaired was that for the extended Balting family, a double plot with a massive granite cross. There are five people buried here, George William Balting, the solicitor, his wife Susan Balting, the Pullman, a dressmaker, and their daughter Amy Balting. Then there's George's two sisters, Jane Ann Balting and Fanny Balting, who were both dressmakers. There's another Balting memorial nearby, on the opposite side of the crossroads, that for James Balting and Elizabeth, the Frost, parents to George, Jane Ann and Fanny Bolting in this plant. Old man James was a plumber, glazier and painter who in 1864 established Bolting Glass and China Warehouse on the High Street, close to the Royal Clarence Hotel. This was a shop on the ground floor and the family lived above. James's son George had higher ambitions and was clearly literate and numerate enough to work as a clerk from the age of 15 in 1851. George was managing clerk for the Bridgewater solicitor Henry Loverbomb. He probably didn't go to university, but would have studied the law additionally in his spare time, advised by his employer, and may have travelled to London to take exams. As a solicitor in a busy market town, the bulk of George's work would have been conveyancing, arranging mortgages, drafting wills, collecting rents, and either prosecuting or defending minor assault cases and other disputes in the local courts. George's entry in various directories described as a solicitor, commissioner for oaths, clerk to Weston's Oil and School Board, and agent to the Scottish Provincial Insurance Company. George also took part in local politics, being on the Bridgewater Division of the Central Conservative Council. George's sisters Jane and Fanny followed their mother Elizabeth, who worked as a staymaker. She was probably doing piecework at home, hand-stitching corsets, which every woman wore at that time. Victorian corsets were elaborate garment with steel stays stitched in, many rows of stitching and a lot of eyelets for lacing. Elizabeth would have taught her two daughters to sew as soon as they could have held a needle, and even while very young, they would have helped their mother by threading needles and picking up pins. Girls soon learned to sew with a speed and dexterity which could only be envied today. Sometime between 1851 and 1861, Jane moved to the West End of London, living and working as a milliner at 12 Princess Street, Hanover Square, London. She was living in a large household of William Priest Stater, a silk merchant and brewer, and his French wife Maria. Jane got training and prestigious experience in this upmarket West End shop, which stood her in good stead for the rest of her life. Meanwhile, in 1861, Fanny, the younger sister, had trained as a draper's assistant and was helping out in her father's shop. By 1871, George had moved his family to Malden House in York Buildings. 
1871, there are 10 people living at George's address. George himself, his wife Susan, sister Jane Anne, and George's children Eustace and Amy. Also living there were two dressmaker's assistants and a dressmaker's apprentice, and two female servants to service the household. Jane had evidently moved back to Bridgewater from London to live with her brother George and set up a dressmaking and millinery business with George's wife Susan. Malden House was a large and centrally located, an ideal address to attract customers. As well as working in the business themselves, Susan and Jane were employing two dressmaker's assistants and an apprentice. Jane's West End experience meant that she would have been able to advise their customers on the latest fashions and colours and give some glamour and elegance to the dressmaking and millinery business she and Susan were running. Jane started her training surrounded by luxurious silks, but much of her work in Bridgewater would have been using more practical fabrics such as wool, cotton and linen. Although affordable domestic sewing machines were available at this time, with four seamstresses and an apprentice working, it is likely that a lot of the hand sewing was being done. Crinolines were going out of fashion, but women's dresses were still very voluminous, with lots of frills, flounces and pleats. Much of the work may have been doing alterations, remaking old dresses to look more up-to-date, and there would also have been many undergarments to be made, such as corsets, chemises, hooped petticoats and drawers, as well as night dresses and outerwear, such as cloaks and capes. When Susan, Jane and their sister Fanny walked out to go to church on a Sunday, they would probably have taken care to wear their smartest, most fashionable clothes and hats to advertise their sewing skills and fashionable sense. In 1881, Jane was still living in the same house as her brother George, but was now shown as head of her own separate household. George's wife Susan was no longer working as a dressmaker, but Jane was employing five assistants. It looks as though Jane had to keep recruiting and training young girls as dressmakers. No doubt these young girls left when they either got better work or got married. Fanny, the younger sister, meanwhile, was living with their widowed mother in Westkey, but was also working as a dressmaker, no doubt together with her sister Jane. By 1889, George and Susan had moved away from York Buildings to live at The Limes, 43 Church Street, leaving Sister Jane at Malden House. In April 1909, Susan died, aged 70. George's sisters, Jane Anne and Fanny, eventually retired together to Bristol, although Jane was in sufficiently poor health to need a nurse to live in with them. When Jane died in Bristol on the 5th of June 1915, aged 78, George had her body brought back to Bridgewater and buried in the family plot in the Wendon Road Cemetery. After Jane's death, Fanny returned to Bridgewater and lived with her brother George and niece Amy in Church Street. George died on the 20th of March 1918, aged 83. His sister Fanny only lived another eight months and died in November 1918, aged 78. A grieving Amy moved away from Church Street, where she'd lived for over 27 years with her parents, to 22 Norfield. Amy never married and she died only six weeks after her father in November 1924, aged 58. She is also buried with her parents and two aunts in the same plot. The repair of the Balting Memorial was hard work. It was much bigger than the other two, and the plot was much less firm due to subsidence. The cross also had to be repaired, having been smashed in two. Fine memorials were able to repair the cross, to lay a new foundation, and also set the curbs in place. Theirs was a fantastic effort to get all this done in a single day. The Friends volunteers then spent time in the following weeks filling in gaps in the curbs and also adding chippings. A few weeks later, the volunteers then turned their attention to the nearby other bolting memorials, which had sunk on one side to level them out. So, these large memorials seem to tell a familiar story of middle-class prosperity in the Victorian age and respectability of small business owners, tradesmen and professionals, living reasonably comfortable lives. However, there is one more working-class story to tell from this year's work, through an unexpected and remarkable find found within the Bolting Memorial. While fine memorials were digging a new base for the Bolting Cross, they unearthed this piece of clearly homemade memorial stone, which commemorates William Storey, who died 31st of January 1888, aged only 20. Looking through the cemetery records, we find his burial, noting that he was buried in Section D quite some distance away. How one of the cemetery's humblest memorials ended up being dumped in one of the grander ones is a mystery. Ryan Pearson of Fun Memorials has suggested that there may have been an unapproved memorial in the paupers section, which was removed and dumped in the general soil or rubble pile, then being used for backfill, and all this seems like a reasonable theory to explain how this fragile memento got from where it should have been into this plot. 
There are two William Storys born in Bridgewater around 1868, but this appears to be the son of Joseph Storey and Maria, or Mary Storey. In the 1871 census, we find them living in Gold's Buildings in Northgate. William's father was a mariner, from a family of mariners, and William had three older brothers and one sister. Gold's Buildings were full of mariners, being in close proximity to the docks and not too far from West Quay. By the 1881 census, the family had moved to Denner's Buildings, more slum cottages in St Mary Street. William was working as a general labourer, even though he was only 14 years old. Seeking a better life, on 20th of January 1885, William Storey enlisted in the Royal Navy as a boy second class. He was following the examples of his two older brothers who had left Bridgewater. Rowland had enlisted in the Army in 1878, and Clifford had enlisted in the Royal Marines in 1883. William's papers detail his service record. HMS Impregnable at Devonport from 20th to 31st January 1885, where he would be trained in seamanship and gunnery, as well as traditional aspects of life at sea. Impregnable was an old Napoleonic ship of the line, which had been converted into a training ship in 1862. He then served on HMS Ganges from 1885 to 1886 for more shore training. Then HMS Impregnable again, 1886 for a while. Then HMS Illegible, 1886 to 1887. Then HMS Royal Adelaide in 1887. Although his character was consistently described as very good, he was discharged, invalided, on 9th of December 1887, and he then returned to Bridgewater. This was clearly because his health had broken down. On 31st January 1888, William Storey died at Queen Street, Bridgewater, aged 19. The cause of death was noted on his death certificate as a 12-month case of tuberculosis. The informant was his mother Maria of the same address. Poor William was buried in a pauper plot, his family being too poor to afford a private burial in the dissenter section of the cemetery, as they seemed to be congregationalist as the service was conducted by the Reverend Edwin Dukes of the Congregationalist Chapel. Some of his family members seem to have made the effort to make this moving tablet, but sadly, as if to add insult to his tragically short life, even this was soon swept away. At least we have recovered this stone, which brought story back from obscurity. And very hearty thanks have to go to Claire Spicer, Hilary Southall and Jill Treviway, who have researched all these fascinating lives. All these memorials were repaired from the Friends' own funds, and the subsidiary works all carried out by the volunteers' own hands and hard work, people giving up their time to make the small piece of Bridgewater better, and respectful to the memory of those people buried there. You can keep up with our work on Facebook or by the diary on the website, which the band of dedicated volunteers make on a weekly basis. We're in desperate need of more volunteers, so if you can help even just a few hours a month, we'll be very keen to hear from you. If you'd like to support our efforts in other ways, consider joining the Friends, making a donation, buying one of our books, or helping out with research, supplying biographies or information for our website. Thank you very much.